Are you an adventurous person? The sort of person who takes the, the road last traveled, who says, look, no hands, who tries the strange new food. Are you adventurous? For most of us, we'd probably say it's complicated. <laughs> we learn from an early age that trying new things is an important part of making the most out of life. It helps us to experience more of the world and, and to get stories that we can tell and, and even to brag about a little bit. But it also requires that we step into the known, the, the unknown, that we willingly enter into situations that we don't have full control of and, and can't predict what's going to happen. Being adventurous can be a bit scary, but on the other hand, it can also give us some of our favorite moments in life. See, most of us, we like to think that we have an adventurous side, and we do, a side of us that uh, likes to break free from the monotony of life that can be fun and spontaneous, and, and, and we can solve problems and rise to the occasion. But truth be told, we also crave predictability and certainty. For example, there, there is a side of me. I love to go camping, to go canoeing, hiking. I uh, love to get out, you know, past civilization, get out in nature and just explore and take in all the sights. Uh, you know, I love to, to go where maybe no other person has ever stepped. Uh, and even, you know, to prove that I can be self-sufficient, I can live off of the land. There's this side of me. And yet there's also the side of me that when I go out has to pack every possible piece of survival gear to go with me so that nothing will take me off guard. Uh, there's the side of me that basically has to bring civilization with me out into nature, uh, you know, except for maybe my bed and my fancy pillow, you know, and then, and then when you wake up in the morning, you're like, oh my gosh, everything hurts and I'm dying. Um, this is the side of me that can't stand being cold uh, that can't be out in the sun for more than 30 minutes without SPF 2000. Um, sounds adventurous, doesn't it? It's complicated. Um, there's, there's one side of me that wants to visit every country in the world to see all the sights, to go off the beaten path to the places that aren't even very touristy and to take it all in. And then there's the side of me that just wants to crash on my couch, that wants to eat my food, watch my show with my people. There's that side of me that is, you know, we, we can handle a little bit of adventure, but usually we're not as adventurous as we think. Because if it's in an area of life that we weren't expecting it, or for longer duration than we'd like, we get uncomfortable, right? We're torn between adventure and stability. We think we're audacious, but usually it's only when we choose to be audacious and intentionally step into it. When we get into uncertainty, when we sit there for too long, we, we, we start to freak out. And what that tells me is that we have control issues. Y'all have control issues. Control seems good to us. Uh, you know, self-control, discipline is even a virtue. It will get you a better life. But control is also a crutch. There's a, a dark side to it because there are times we're trying to control things that we shouldn't be controlling, control, trying to control things that are beyond our ability to even control. And, and that doesn't stop us from trying. Um, and, and when we try to take the uncertainties that are intrinsic to life and we fight to gain certainty around them, the more controlling we get, the more the thrill of adventure slips out of our lives. Most importantly, the adventure that God wants for us. In John chapter three, it's our text for today. There's a man named Nicodemus and he's at a crossroads in life. He, he's unsure in the moment if he should lean into one part of his nature or the other part. And we get to see what Jesus says to him. So it says there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night. He didn't want to be seen. He's not sure about all this and what people would think. He came to Jesus at night and he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. And Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born 
again. Born again. This takes Nicodemus off guard, catches him off guard, because he would have felt certain, like all the other Jews that, that he knew, that he already had inherited the kingdom of God by nature, by virtue of his first birth, his physical birth. As someone who had been born into a Jewish family, into that religious and ethnic group, he would have grown up hearing that the Old Testament promises applied to him. He would have grown more and more certain throughout his life that he was living in a way that pleased and honored God, particularly as a member of the Sanhedrin, the, the ruling, ruling council. He was a big deal. And all of that came from his birth. That was the foundation that it was all organized around. It was all very tightly controlled and put together. And yet Jesus says, if you really want to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. What do you think of when you hear born again? That phrase. It's one of the, the big Christian cliches. You know, I heard it a lot growing up in Texas. It was part of our cultural vernacular, part of our vocabulary. And, and what I gathered that it meant when I heard it um, was that they were asking, have you had that mountaintop experience moment where, where you've been overcome by your need for God and you've prayed to, to give your life over to Jesus. And if you've had that moment, then you could tell the, the place, the, the time, uh, you know, you could tell the emotions that you're feeling, all of the particulars that made up your birth certificate of your conversion experience. And I grew up hearing a lot of testimonies like that. And my impression was that in saying you were born again or in asking that question, it was about pointing back to that moment of salvation. But I've learned over time that just as important is the adventure that lies ahead, not only behind, but in front of us to embrace not just one moment, but an ongoing process of change and transformation. And, and this is how Nicodemus responds to this whole born again thing. Like I said, it catches him off guard. Uh, he goes, how can someone be born again when they're old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Now, it's really hard to know how to take Nicodemus in this moment, how to interpret his words. And I think that the various English translation, they bear witness to this little bit of nuance and little bit of um, imprecision. Because some translations, like this NIV translation, the way it's translated, it makes it feel like, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. But then other translations, they pick up on the question mark that's in the Greek text. And it's, it's more like, can he enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born? I'm Ron Burgundy? What? And, and it, it comes across more as this, this question. And when we, we read this, we're like, like, surely he can't be for real, right? He's not really literally asking this question if, if it's possible to do this. Uh, you know, either he's trolling us or we've got to take it as a rhetorical question, right? Uh, but, but regardless, I think he's right about one thing, that there are times in our life where change is just as hard as entering back into the womb. The older we, we get, the more set in our ways we tend to become. And we just can't deny the influence of the habits and customs we've built up over the course of years. And, and the more you practice, the more it becomes permanent. And, and so the more we, we've practiced these habits and customs, the more averse and, of, to change we've become. I, I think about in my own life, um, for years, I put the remote control in a really weird spot. All right, so if I'm sitting on the couch, the coffee table would be in front of me and I'd put the remote control like in the top right corner of the coffee table. That's just what I had always done. And then I started dating Megan and, and she would come over and see that and she'd be like, why? She's like, isn't that like totally illogical? Like when you're sitting on the couch, you can't even reach it. You have to lean forward to go grab it. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So why do you do that? And I was like, well, I don't know. It's just what I'd always done. And I guess there was no reason why I couldn't think about changing it, but it also felt wrong <laughs> to, to put it anywhere else. Or maybe this will apply to you. You know, many of us have a, a side of the bed that we sleep on, right? Where my left sider's at. This is an interactive moment. You can raise your hand. Left siders. Okay, good, good. Right siders. Where are you at? Okay. 
All right, what about straight down the center? Anyone straight down the center? You defy convention. You're a rebel. But we all have these habits, but most of us, like, you probably couldn't tell me why you developed that habit for most of us. There, there's no, but there's no reason either why you couldn't change it. But that would be weird, right? <laughs> Something feels wrong about that. The, the reality is, it's the same way with our faith journey. The longer we've been a Christian, the more set in our routine, in our practice of the faith, we've become. Our, 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 just like Nicodemus and his Jewish friends, the practice of our faith, of our Christianity, tends to become pretty fixed. And we don't give it a second thought, but think about it in this moment, right? Most of us, we pray at the same time of day, or, or we don't. We go to the same church service, sit in the same spot in the sanctuary. Anyone guilty of that today? Yeah, yeah. Few are like, no, I'm like one pew in front of that spot. I, I'm a rebel. Um, we interact with the same people, don't we? Or maybe if you're that other person, you kind of sneak out the same way every time to avoid the interaction. You know, we, we tend to give the same amount or not, or volunteer uh, or not. And all of this, it feels routine, safe, comfortable, manageable. And then we have Jesus in John 3 saying, don't forget that the life a faith involves a rebirth that radically destabilizes our existing patterns. He says of this rebirth, very truly, I tell you that no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. What Jesus is talking about here is this transformation that we call baptism. Baptism. That whether you were baptized as a, as a child or came to faith as an adult and you were baptized soon after, to be born again is to receive God's gift of grace and to emerge from the water a new man or a new woman. And there's this beautiful parallel in this text that Jesus is hinting at, that he seems to be bringing out with the creation account. Way back in the book of Genesis, uh, it talks about the creation of the world and it says that the earth was formless at that time and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And then God, he begins his work of creating all the things that are in this world and all creatures. And it culminates in the creation of Adam and Eve. And then he animates these humans, these new creatures with his breath, with the very breath of God. And in this passage, we also have the water and the Spirit joining together in this act of God to bring us out as new creations. And, and this Greek word for spirit, pneuma, it could also mean breath, this, this very breath of God that animates us for a new life of faith. You see, baptism, it's far more than, than a photo op or, or you know, just an act of obedience, but rather it is the transformative act that starts the journey of faith. Baptism orients us toward a life of following, of living by the Spirit. And to that point, Jesus says this. He says, you should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And this is a really layered verse. I'm gonna read this again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is engaged in a mysterious work of regeneration and transformation over the course of our lives. This passage says a lot about what it means to, to live a Spirit-led life, and we can, we can take a lot out of it. And first off, we learned that spirit-led life is as God pleases. That we didn't start our life of faith by entering back into the womb, but rather God brought us rebirth by his grace and mercy. He's the one who's the captain of the ship. He's driving. And just when we figure out, we think how God operates and we think he's going to turn one way, he frustrates our formulas. He turns the starboard instead of port. The life and the Spirit is as he pleases, not as we please. And it's on his timing. We don't know how long he's going to have us in any one season or not. We don't know necessarily when he's going to give us the answer to our prayers or how long 
we're going to have to wait. We're along for the ride. And a life that's spirit-led is exploring our charted territory, that we don't know exactly where God is going to take us or what he's going to have us doing every step of the way. I mean, just think about what Jesus gave to his disciples when he called them. This is what they got. They got, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. No set destination, no set duration, just follow me. He doesn't say, bring your GPS and your camping stove and your energy bars and and all the things. He just says, let's go. I'm going to make you fishers of men. And they're probably like, I have no idea what that means, but okay. And and he's going to reveal it to them along the way. Because life is supposed to be an adventure. Turn to your neighbor and say, life is an adventure. Life is an adventure. (laughs) Seldom does transformation happen in a controlled environment. When was the the last time you had a big light bulb moment or or a huge change in perspective and it just happened in the course of regular status quo? No, in the turmoil, in the unpredictability, that's when we grow. And that's the point. Jesus, he knows what's best for us and what's healthiest for us. And that's to learn to follow him wherever he leads. You see, so often we always want to know the exact path that God has in store for us in advance. God, I'll follow you anywhere just as long as you tell me where and for how long and you give me enough time to prepare. We don't like uncertainty. Uh, Anytime we're looking ahead, we can't quite see it. We don't know if we're going to be able to handle all the things. That's when we start reaching for the rudder of the ship. That's when we start hovering our hand over the pause button. We're trying to get control however we can possibly gain it. Just think about the last time you were anxious about something and how you tried to control it by thinking it through or, or by telling people what to do or whatever you could do. You tried to control it. Even right now. There's things in all of our lives, if we really think about it, that we're uncertain about. And we hate that. We don't like it. But there it is. And it's into these moments that that Jesus simply says to us, follow me. One step at a time, one foot in front of the other, follow. And he says to us, embrace openness rather than resistance to uncertainty. This is what we have to do. This is the call. Would you just read this with me again? Embrace openness rather than resistance to uncertainty. To to begin to figure out that uncertainty and and not having everything figured out, that's not always a bad thing. In in fact, many times it's a really good thing. When when I was a, a, a teenager, a young teenager, I would spend summers in Michigan and um, often at my grandparents' place on Lake Charlevoix, which is a small lake off of Lake Michigan. And, you know, we just, we loved the lake life for those summers. And we'd hang out with our cousins and, and had great memories from that time. And we loved boating and tubing. But, you know, I was pretty young and couldn't drive the boat or go out on the boat myself. But my, my grandparents, they had a friend, Dick Franson was named, and uh, he offered to teach me how to sail. And he had this, this boat. It was a sunfish. Uh, it looked exactly like this one. I was super excited to find this picture. Um, but as you can see, it's like a 10, 11, 12-foot boat. Um, doesn't exactly look as fun as a jet ski. You know, not the world's biggest craft or most exciting. Uh, but the appeal for me, the, the draw, the sell, was that it would be a boat I could take out on my own. And so I thought, okay, that sounds great. And so... You know, he took me out. Dick taught me how all the tips and tricks. He taught me the ropes. And before long, I was sailing. And uh, what I soon found out um, is that you can never quite predict what the experience is going to be. Um, I don't know if you know this, but uh, sailboats are, are wind-powered. Um, and pastors are, are rumored to be able to, you know, control the force. But I can't control the wind. When I go out, anytime I would go out, embark on a journey, regardless of what the wind was doing when you set out, you just never knew what it was going to do once you were out there. There were some times it would be steady. Other times you'd get out and it would die and you'd just be sitting there. It would take you forever to get back. It was so boring. And then other times, the, the best times, 
the, the wind would pick up and it would be fierce and strong and there'd be white caps on the waves and the sail would be full and you'd be leaning over the boat to keep it from falling, uh, from, from tipping over and you'd just be shooting through the waves. It seemed like it was going like 100 miles an hour, you know, faster than any jet ski and, and you'd be slicing through the waves and the water was splashing all, all over. And so it is with a spirit-led life. We can't predict the wind we can only harness it. We, we rig the sails and we wait for God to fill them and surrender to him. Wherever he leads us, however he gets us there, we remain open. Jesus, he shows us what openness toward God looks like. Jesus was God in the flesh. So unlike us, he can see the path ahead. And what he saw as he prayed in the garden of Gethsemane was he, he could see he was about to be betrayed by a friend. He would be mocked. He would be tortured. He could see the cross and the tomb. And he prayed, God, if it be your will, let's, let's do things differently. If there's a different way to accomplish the mission, let's do that. But he doesn't try to control the situation. And Jesus doesn't try and, and, and change it on his own. He remains open and he simply prays, your will be done. Your will be done. Because Jesus can see that there's good on the other side of the grave. He can see that through his death and resurrection, that it's going to open the gates of heaven for you and me so we can live with hope. We can live and know that God loves us. He's got us firmly in his hands. We get to be reconciled with our Creator. Jesus sees this too. And so he prays this prayer of trust and he teaches all who would follow after him the same prayer. Remember, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, may your will be done. That, that's the prayer that he teaches us to embrace. That's a prayer of adventure. And, and this can be a scary prayer too, right? If you're, I mean, if you're, if you're familiar with the Bible, you know, like this is God's will is what brought a lot of the apostles to an early grave. Uh, and we pray this all the time. We kind of skip right over it, but it's like, we're all, we're all just kind of okay with that. This is a dangerous prayer. I mean, Christians throughout history, it's led Christians, you know, to do crazy things like take care of plague victims at total risk to themselves. It's led Christians to give up comforts, to, to give away their time and, and their money to turn the other cheek to love their enemies, to risk their lives, and even lay them down. The, the born-again journey is not a predictable journey. It's filled with risk. So, so why would we embrace that journey? Why, why should Nicodemus give up his power, his control, his career in older order to be born again? There's a psalm that I pray most mornings, been praying it a lot lately. It's Psalm 136. This is a, a narrative psalm. It, it tells the story of God creating the world and the history of him sustaining his people and, and intervening to rescue his people. It's a great psalm. And, and it tells us that God is the God of gods. He's the Lord of lords. He does great wonders. He split the seas by his power and command so that the Israelites could walk through. He brought God's people into the promised land. But before the psalm tells us any of those things, I never caught the significance of this, but the first thing it tells us is this. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Turn to your other neighbor, tell him God is good. God is good. God's goodness is his distinguishing quality. Um, it's, it's the most important thing we need to know about him. It's the first thing in the psalm before anything else, because all throughout life, we're going to need this. There's going to be times when we have our expectations and we're, we're praying for God to work in a certain way. We need him to come through in a certain way for us. We're expecting it. It makes sense. And we're saying, okay, God, and that he doesn't. And, and everything in us, we, do, we just want to say, God, you called me to follow. You called me to trust you. And then you didn't come through. Where are you at? Those moments have come, they will come. And in those moments, the most important thing for us to remember is that God is good. He's working for our good. 
even though we can't see it, even though we can't see why life took a turn, why the path got really treacherous, but we know that he is good. He is for us. He knows what we need even better than we need what we know ourselves. And so knowing that, can we then begin to be open to a change of plans whenever that change happens, whenever it comes up? Can we set aside the need for the full bank account or a full pantry before we follow Jesus, right? Can we just take that step of faith and instead pray for daily bread? knowing that God will provide for me along the way. And can we we trust that life is far more rich, far more whole when we embrace the adventure that God has in store for us, knowing that goodness is not just on the other side, but it's in the midst of the journey. And this is hard for me, guys. I have this steady personality. I, I love to have things planned out in advance. I love a good spreadsheet. Love a good spreadsheet. You know, I like uh, to, to have contingencies for everything. Uh, you know, I'm very organized, very get all the details under control, but I've had to realize over time how this desire to have certainty in life, it, it can get in the way of me trusting God. Megan and I, we celebrated our, our anniversary this past week, and it was Thinking of our, our honeymoon, we, we went to Greece. Here's some pictures. Look at those kids. Um, and on this trip, as we started to plan, we, we started to think about all the things we wanted to do and, and line up all the details and lodgings and so forth. And then we just had this sense, like maybe we're not supposed to plan out all of the details in advance. And we really leaned into that, that voice and we, we thought, what if we just got the plane tickets? What if we got the first night's stay in Athens, booked at a hotel, but then after that, left it all wide open? Um, and, th- and that's what we did. And so we, we go, we wake up that second day and we're like, okay, everything, all possibilities are in front of us. And we had some idea of what we would do. So we hopped on this ferry to head out to an island and there was gonna be a moment of truth. I was a little nervous about this because we get to the island, you're like, okay, is there going to be a place to stay? Is it going to be hard to get around? Or is everything going to be booked up? Or are the prices going to be jacked up? And like, you just had no idea what to expect. And so I'm nervous and, and the ferry's approaching the island and you're like, moment of truth. And then we get off and there's like dozens of people there with pictures of their lodgings. And they're like, stay at my hotel, stay at my rental. And I, I just had to laugh. I'm like, and I was worried. <laughs> you know, like God totally came through. It was this total God moment. And, and, you know, not everything on the vacation was so easy. We had to make some decisions on the fly. But man, I wouldn't trade that experience for anything. And, and it just reminds me that, that embracing the adventure God has in store for us, it is the better way. And don't get me wrong, you know, don't be mistaken. At its core, the adventurous life, it's not about travel or about wild experiences that that would be chasing after the wind. But a real life of adventure is trusting the spirit. And it may look different. The spirit may lead us differently depending on who we are and what he's got in store for us. It may mean fighting Goliath, uh, or it could mean just living with integrity and generosity. It could mean a life filled with extraordinary experiences or a life of extraordinary consistency. He called Noah, hey, build this boat for the next hundred years of your life every day over and over again. But that's a life of adventure too, because a life of adventure is learning what the voice of the Spirit sounds like and cultivating an open posture to hear and to follow. A life in the spirit is letting go of trying to control every element of our own destiny and trusting it and leaving it up to God. A life in the spirit values preparation more than planning. Because when we plan and we sink all this time into our plans and they inevitably fall through, then they're worthless. But preparation is always going to be worth it. It's always going to pay different dividends, particularly the preparation of our character. A life of adventure values transformation over comfort. And on that journey, when things go sideways and get challenging, 
And it doesn't mean that God isn't good. And it doesn't mean that, that we're on the wrong path. It's just part of the journey. And it's a reminder to listen. What might God be speaking to you as you hear all of this today? Is there anything that, that rises to the top for you that God might be saying, I put this in front of you? If it's, if it's something like engaging more with the body of Christ or, or scripture, uh, if it's being more generous, serving your neighbor, joining an action team, if it's saying I'm sorry, if it's getting off the sidelines and volunteering, you don't have to think too hard. You don't have to pray about those things. Those are pre-approved in God's word. You can just go for it. If it's been a long time since you experienced the goodness of God in a fresh way, let this be your, your moment Hear the Spirit talking to you today. This is your call to take a step and see where God takes you. Because I don't know about you, but for me, I, I don't want to just go through life with routine, status quo, faith. As I, I go throughout life, I realize life is a gift. God has given it to us to cherish. We get one, so let's live it. The call is not just believe, but to follow after him. And I don't know about you, I want to see what God has in store for me. I want my life to count and to matter. And so I know that for certain, I can't settle. I just need to follow and really even just take that first step. In the journey of life, it would be really nice if there was a map and we could see it all laid out for us in advance. It would be great if there were mile markers along the way so we could be absolutely certain at any step that we were on the right path. But then we'd miss out on the blessings of discovering God's goodness in the unknown. The compass of the Spirit and an adventurous, willing heart is all we need to discover that the best paths in life are unpaved. God, we, we thank you for bringing us to this moment in this place where we can be in your presence, Lord, and we can experience your goodness anew and afresh. We thank you that though we haven't always listened, though we tend to control things and recede into safety, Lord, you pursued us. You still pursue us. You are faithful to us just as you have always been. And you have so much wholeness in store for us when we pursue the life of adventure you set in front of us. God, may we be a people who even when it's tough to trust, may we be people who say, okay, God, may your will be done. I know it's better, I can't quite see how, but I'm gonna trust you even when it's hard and see where you lead. And so church, as we take a moment now, we'll provide just a little bit of space to be honest with God. And in those times in your life, there are all those times where we know that, oh, that was probably the spirit talking to me, the spirit tugging me a certain direction and I resisted. It was uncomfortable. I didn't want to do it and so I resisted. Take a moment just to lay all of those moments of self-control before God, trusting his forgiveness and to pray around those things that he might be bringing up for you to take a step into next.